Good evening, Good evening, everyone. Good evening. How's it? Good evening. How's Good evening. Is everyone well? Yeah, uh, Rob. Yep. How are you? Is everyone well? Baruch Thank Hashem. God. Yes, we are. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. It's so nice to hear everyone. Really. Oh, wow. Let's see myself. Am I there? I don't know where I am. Okay, I'm there. Okay, Dr. Les with us. Everyone with us. Baruch Hashem. Okay, okay so I'm going to mute everyone because there's a hell of a noise in the background. Dr. Les, you can unmute yourself. I'm on a picture now. We all, I hope that you can all hear me. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Dr. Les, give us the news, please. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Just, uh, I just was thinking about this, you know, it's an amazing thing we said on um, Simcha's Torah, um, here we said, Mashiva Rucho Morirag Hashem, and you, we actually got rain, it's amazing, you know, this, uh, I cannot tell you, living in Israel, and when you read in Tanakh, and you read in the Chumash, and you read in the Siddur, and it actually comes true, and the weather's changed, it's just unbelievable that it changed at this particular time. <laughs> but but it's just amazing. So um, such a blessing, and I just wish you all could be here, and you all will come, please God. But they are opening. They think that they're going to be opening up the uh, for for people to come from South Africa to come to Israel. And um, just we want to wish you all a baruch haba when you do come. But it's nice. Not... It's you. You see people. It's life is getting back to normal again. Baruch Hashem. No, Baruch Hashem, it's 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 very important. It's very very important. Okay. Love to you all. Please God. So first of all, I would like to wish everyone Rosh Chodesh Tov, Meshiva Ruach, Umarid Ageshem, Rosh Chodesh Hashvan. Baruch Hashem, thank you, Doctor Les, for all the updating. Uh, here in South Africa, we're expecting load shedding at nine o'clock, so I'm not going to waste any more time. I'm going to start immediately with the Sheol. We on Sheol on Parashat Noah. Um, Louis, when you're ready, just unmute yourself. Okay, so we're going to delegate the Sheol in, in the name of uh, Esther Kaden Bat Ketia, Mordechai Ben Rahma, Harav Avraham Haim Ben Eliezer Yaakov, Tamar Bat Zehava, Rahel Bat Malka Sultana Yaakov, Salomon Ben Farhat, Vorarut Bat Bela, Vehaim Eliyahu Ben Ishayahu. Please God, that the show will be to uplift their soul. Also, Lerefua, what it means, Lerefua, in health of Leora Bat Miriam, Menashe Naji Ben Farha, Orna Bluma Bat Miriam, Arab Abraham Ben Marima, Arab Shlomo Yuda Ben Dalia, Arab Moshe Ben Devora, Eitan Ben Hadassa, Israel Ben Zisa, Mordechai David Ben Lea, Yosef Ben Esther, Devora Bat Esther, Chadok Ben Stara, Shulamit Bat Haya Shein Alea, Vedavid Yitzhak Ben Hava Lea, Yehudit, please God, Refua Shlema, to them and to call Hole Upchoa Amo Israel, Behol Makom Sheem. Okay, we're going to start the show now. We on in Parashat Noah, and Parashat Noah start like this. Ele toldot Noah. Noah, ish tzedik tamim, haya bedorotav. These are the offsprings of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, perfect in, in, his, uh, uh, perfect in his generation. Noah walked with God. Okay, here we see something very interesting about Noah, but first I'm going to do the introduction for the parasha. Noah born in the year 1056 for the creation to his father Lemech and to his mother Ashmoa Bet Elishua. In the year 1536 from the creation, Akadosh Baruch Hu revealed to Noah for the first time that he's planning to bring a flood to the world. That means it's a hundred years before the flood. Noah in that time was in the age of 480 years old and he started building the ark 
And that's where Hazal learned that it took Noah to build the ark 120 years. In the year 1554 for the creation, okay, Noah married his wife, Naama. Naama was the daughter of Eli, of Lemech, of, of Hanoch, sorry, the daughter of Hanoch. And uh, when uh, Noah married Naama, Noah was in the age of 498 years old, while Naama was in the age of 580. Sure. She was almost 100 years older. Listen to that, almost 100 years older than Noah. Okay. In the year 1556 from the creation, Noah in the age of 500, okay, then you have the firstborn Yefet. A year later, you have his second son, Ham. In the year, uh, in the age of 502, that means another year, after that, he had his little son, Shem. So that's where the descendants of all the Jews come. Okay, during the years, uh, this noise at the back, I need to mute everyone because it's, if I hear a little bit of noise, for some reason, I can't focus. Don't know why. Lou, you unmute yourself just now. Okay. Uh, during those years, Noah tried, obviously, to speak to his people from his generation to do tshuva, but obviously nothing happened. In the year one, 1656 for the creation, Noah and his wife and his son and his daughter-in-law and the animal started to enter the teva. And the 17th of Heshvan, okay, the flood starting in that year, and the 17th of Heshvan, the flood starting to come down into the world, Noah at that time was in the age of 600. In the year 1657 from the creation, the flood stopped. Kadosh Baruch stopped the flood after a year. At the beginning, Noah sent the crow. He make a circle and he come back. Then he sent the dove. The dove been sent three times, not like many people think that it's been sent twice. Akadosh, Noah sent the dove. The dove again make a circle and come back. After that, after seven days, Noah sent again the dove. This time, the dove, when she gone, she brought a leaf of an olive tree with her. After that, Seven days later, he sent her again, he sent her dove for the third time. And this time the dove flew away and never come back. When Noah came out of the ark, we know that he built the ark. And on the ark, from the table, when he came out of the ark, he built an altar, sorry. And he started bringing sacrifice. He sacrificed the kosher animal and the kosher birds to Akadosh Baruch Hu, and the Torah tells us that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has so much pleasure and enjoyment from the smell of the Korbanot that he promised that he will never bring flood anymore to the world. And the sign for it was the rainbow in the heaven. We know that Noah, when he came out, he planted a tree of grapes. After that, he got drunk. From, he made wine and he got drunk. In the year 1788 from the creation was the story of the building of the Tower of Babel. That mean that in that time, Akadosh Baruch Hu changed the languages of all the people because until then the Zohar Akadosh said that they used to speak Sfat HaKodesh, that mean Hebrew, and Akadosh Baruch Hu spread them all over the world. That's me. That in the year 1788 from the creation, that when was the story of Migdal Babel. Why is the city of Babylon called Babylon? Hazal explained that Akadosh Baruch Hu Balal, what it means Balal, separate the languages, okay? Balal it's Fatam. And that's why it's called Babel, Milshon Balal. That's why the city 
that call Babel, that that's in Iraq, Babylon, that's why it's called Babel. Now we're going to start the Pasha, and as Louis read it so beautifully, we have to understand. It says, Elo Teldot Noah. The Torah tells us that Noah was a righteous man and a Tamim. I don't know what the right explanation, Louis, maybe you can help me or anyone else. The word Tamim, how would you translate it? I would say very, very righteous. Okay. A very, a very, very righteous man. Okay. Very, very righteous man. So the Torah tells us that Noah was a very, very righteous man. And I saw in a book that called Doresh Tzion, that been written by a Rav Ben Tzion, ben Tzion Mutzaf Shalita. And he explained that Noah lived in a generation that everyone was wicked. Not only that everyone was wicked and the, the, the land was full of Hamas, okay? We know that Akadosh Baruch Hu could not find any rectification for those people. That means that that generation can never do tshuva. That means that they didn't have a hope. And Akadosh Baruch Hu brought the flood into the world. Why? Because that generation can never do tshuva. The generation of the flood was so corrupt and was so wicked that there is no chance. And Adoso, we see that Noah himself managed to survive during that difficult time. And I would like to bring a story and then to try to explain what happened in a story, and it's a true story, to what happened with Noah. The story goes like this. The story starts with the Gaon Mivilna. The Gaon Mivilna, you all know, Rabbi Eliyahu ben Shlomo Zalman Mivilna. He born around 301 years ago. There is some say that he born in Lita, some say in Vilna. It's all the same area. It's not the point at the moment. But one day he met the Magid Miduvna. The Magid Miduvna, it's Rabbi Yaakov Krenz. Rabbi Yaakov Krenz born 300 years ago in Lita. And when he met him, he said, um, Shalom Aleichem, Rabbi Yaakov. He said, Rabbi Yaakov, you traveling different city, different town, and different shoes. You meet different people all the time. And to each one of them, and each city, and each shoe, you give Musa. You give him the Musa. The only one that you never give Musa is to me. Rabbi Yaakov Krenz, at the beginning, was shocked that the Gedol Ador, the Gaon Mivilna, gonna ask him to give Divrei Musar to him. It's Gedol Ador, what are you talking? Say the Gaon Mivilna to Rabbi Yaakov Krenz like this. Every person need Musar, even Gedol Ador. And Rabbi Yaakov agreed in the end, and he said, Musar, what can I say? So he said to him, listen, Rabbi Eliyahu, you know, it's not a chokmah to be the Gaon Mivilna if all day you sit at home and you have only four walls. Chokmah to be the Gaon Mivilna when you're moving on. What does it mean moving on? When you go and you go to London, you go to Amsterdam, you go to the central station, when you meet people, when you integrate with people, it means the Hochma to be the Gaon Mivilna, it's not when you lock yourself behind four doors, behind four walls. The Hochma is to be the Gaon Mivilna when you integrate with people. When you go and you meet, you work, you associate with other people. And I do all of that. You still keep your personality and you keep your identity as a Jewish and become a righteous person and you become the Gaon. That's the Chokhmah. So from here we see what was the idea behind. Say the Mefarshim explained, and also Rabbi Ben Sion Mutafi explained like this. But the Chokhmah behind it is the Torah tell us that Noah was a righteous man. When he was a righteous man, Noah was a righteous man during the worst the worst generation that was, one of the worst generation, that they sin with immorality. Not only that, they sit with idol worshiping. And 
with gezel. Gezel is robbery. So from here we see something very important. We see that Hazal tell us and teach us that although all of those challenges that Noah had, he still was a righteous man. That he had to face people, he had to speak to people. There is the influence. There is a major influence of the society because usually people that integrate with other people, there is unfortunately after a while, people influence on you. Noah was a righteous man, not only that he was a righteous man, he was very righteous, that he never been influenced by others. And that's what the Torah come to tell us, that although that Noah have challenges, he still kept himself and he become a righteous. Now, I'm gonna bring the Rabbeinu Behaya. Rabbeinu Behaya that I'm gonna bring, Rabbeinu Behaya Ben Asher, he born in the city of Saragossa, in Spain, 776 years ago. And he said, a matter of fact, what we call a tzaddik, righteousness, there is three different levels. The first level of a person that you can call him a righteous, that everything that you do, you're doing it straight. Everything is doing according to halacha, according to the book, what we call it in English. He doesn't have no left, no right. There is black or white. And he go with the white. There is no gray in the middle. And that's the first level of a person that will be called righteous person. After that, there is a higher level, a higher madrega, okay, from the first one, that when a person do everything, not only with other people, also with himself, 100%. What does it mean? That when he find a leniency, He's not always looking for a leniency. He doesn't go to Rabbi Google and he search the halacha and when he find a leniency, okay, I'll go with that. When most of the halacha say no, he'll find a one rabbi that given a leniency and with that he go, no. Say, Rabbi Nubehaya, that everything that he do, he doesn't do any tricks. The halacha said to do, he done. He doesn't play a game. That's a higher level that not only that he's righteous, he's 100% righteous also with his heart. That means no tricks. He doesn't look for any different leniency. The third level of righteousness, that's the highest. Listen to that. It's said that there is a person that all the time, whatever he do, he had the almighty with him. That means when he go on holiday, when he go on business, when he go to work, whatever he do, he have in mind the Almighty. What does it mean? Is the Almighty gonna be happy with the way that I behave in holiday, the way that I behave on a business, the way that I behave when I go to work with my workers or with my colleagues and etc. And that's what Hazal say, that Eta Elohim Italech Noah, Noah all the time, have the Almighty in his mind. Whatever he thought, it was what Akadosh Baku will think about him. And that's the highest level. I'm going to bring now what Ari Kadosh is going to tell us. Ari Kadosh is Rabbi Tzhak Luri Ashkenazi. He born in Jerusalem 487 years ago. And he actually find certain hints, and not only that, certain situation that happened to Moshe Rabbeinu and to Noah to prove that they from the same soul. For example, he said like this, let's start like this, he said. Noah to survive where he was in a Teva. During the flood for a year, Noah was in a Teva. That's how he saved his life. The Teva saved his life. Say Moshe Rabbeinu, how has he been saved from the decree of the Egyptian to kill every male that born in Egypt? By that, that his mother put him in a teva. That means that the teva saved Noah and the teva saved Moshe Rabbeinu. Not only that, Noah, while he was in a ark, in a teva, for those 12 months, he had to separate from his wife. Obviously that they lived together in a table, but they couldn't have physical relationship. 
we see the same happen with Moshe Rabbeinu. When HaKadosh Baruch Hu revealed himself to Moshe Rabbeinu, what happened? That Moshe became Isha Elohim. What does it mean become Isha Elohim? The man of God. Then we know that he separated from his wife Tzipor. Again, the same situation that happened to one, happened to the other one. Said the Ari HaKadosh, I'm going to bring you now a different idea to prove that Moshe, that the soul of Moshe was the soul of Noah. In Sefer Shmot, in Parashat Kitisa, in chapter 32, verse 32, Lev Lev, okay? Lamed Bet, Lamed Bet, it is Lev, is a heart. It said there in the verse something very interesting. It said, Mehenina misefrecha ashter katafta. What it's me. Moshe Rabbeinu said to the Kadosh Baruch Hu, if you're going to destroy that nation that was after the sin of the golden calf, please erase my name from your holy book. Say, Ari Kadosh, you know, if you take the word Mehenina, the two words, Mehenina, erase me. Okay, that's the English translation. If you twist the letters, you'll see that you'll get Minoah honey. I'm from Noah. That's me. That here Moshe Rabbeinu hinting to us in the Torah, say Ari Kadosh, that it's Ari Kadosh. We all know that was one of the great mystical rabbi that we have. And he say, Meheni na, Minoah honey. Am, my soul, is from the soul of Noah. He say, you want to find another thing? No problem. In chapter 33, in the same parasha, in Parashat uh, Kitisa, in chapter 33, verse 13, what is Moshe Rabbeinu say? Im namachati hen be'enecha. That means if I find the favor in your eyes. Say, Ari Kadosh, hen, if you take the word hen, change the letters nun and het, instead of het, nun, that's het, et hen, that means like, favorite, change that letters to Nun and Het, you'll get the letters Noah. Again, Moshe Rabbeinu said, here he proved that his soul, Se'ari Kadosh, from the soul of Noah. So we see from here that, what are we learning from here? That Moshe, that the soul of Moshe was the soul of Noah, the same Neshamot, the same souls. And then in the end, towards the end of the verse, it said bedorotab, the word bedorotab, and his generation in plural. And many of the Mefarshim say, why does it say like this in plural? It should say, Noah, ish tzadik tamim haya bedoro. Noah was a righteous man in his generation. What it mean in single, bedoro, and his own. No, here it say in generations. With S, that means many generations. Many of them found him say, why? Why write many generations? Why Noah lived in his generation? No, generation, all of those. So to answer to that, many of them found him explain, and the answer to it actually come from the Mishnah and Masechet Avot. That's brought by many of them found him also Arab. Ben Shion Tzafi Shalita bringing it. He said, look at the Mishnah in Masechet Avot. In chapter five, in Mishnah Bet, it said, me'adam arishon ve'ad noah. The, the Mishnah, Hazal and the Mishnah tell us that was 10 generation from Noah, from Adam arishon, sorry, from Adam until Noah. That mean that Noah lived during that time. Then the, Torah, the Mishnah continue and tell us, Asara dorot minoah ve'ad adam arishon. That means that Noah again lived until Abraham again, another 10 generation. So we learn from here that the matter of fact, that it said bedorotav, that the Torah tell us that in his generation, in plural, you know why? Because Noah merit to live in many generations. And that's why the Torah tell us Bedorotah. I would like to move on because I'm frightened from the Lord shedding and the time is half past eight or 8.25. I don't want to be cut. So I'm actually going to accelerate today with the Shahu. 
Uh, let's move to chapter six, verse 14, Louis. And it's like this. עשה לך תיבת גופר, עשה לך תיבת עצי גופר, קנים תעשה את התיבה, וקברת אותה מבית ומחוץ בכופר. Okay, I've got it. They and every beast after the, its uh, kind, every animal after its kind, and every creeping thing that creeps in, on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, and every bird of any kind of wing. I think that you ranked the wrong one. 14. Aselecha tevat atzei gofer. Yeah, chapter 6, verse 14. Yeah, I think it's chapter 6. Verse 14. He doesn't speak about bird. He speak about the Teva. Made the Teva. That, goes, that takes me to chapter 8, yeah. Okay. What's Chapter really six, on? verse 14. Chapter six, that's what I'm looking at. Verse 14. Made the Teva from a special Wait, yeah, wood. Wait, hang on, hang on. It's, just, it's yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Make for yourself an ark of gopa wood. Make the ark with compartments and cover it inside and out with pitch. Okay, here Akadosh Baruch Hu said to Noah, make the teva, make the art from uh, the wood that called gopher, okay, and make compartment, different section. Rashi Akadosh actually take the word kanim. Rashi Akadosh is Rabbi Shlomo Yitzhaki. He born in the north of France in the city of Troyes, and he born 981 years ago. And he said that when it say here kanim, it's different compartment, different section in a table. And we have to understand what did Rashi try to explain to us? What is different compartment? So the Mefarshim explained like this, listen to that. Listen, the con how Noah was considerate. Noah, when he built the Teva, he made a different compartment. He made the compartment number one that was solid from wood. And then inside, he made also compartment that make what we call it for like a partition, you know, dry walling. They didn't have dry walling, but from a tenor wood. And Hazal explained why did Noah have to make so many different compartments? The Mepharshim explained like this, Noah was a righteous man and he was considerate what happened to every animal. Look at this consideration, because certain animals eat in certain time. Certain animals sleep in certain time. Noah didn't want to make one big compartment and to leave all the animals to be together. Therefore, what is he done? What did he done? He done like this. He done that he took the middle section. First of all, let me introduce the, the table been built from three different levels. On a top level, on the top level, on a third level, Noah and his kids and his wife lived. And the middle level, that where was all the animal. And the first level, the bottom level, that where was all the garbage that left. So when Noah built the second compartment, the second level, he made so many compartments that not any animal will disturb one each other. That these certain animals sleep early, they can go to sleep. Certain animals at night, they are awake like predators. They're not going to disturb those that need to sleep early. They want to eat, they eat in different time. He was so considerate, Noah, that Hazal Tell us, I'd say gopher kanin. That means that he make different compartment to each animal. Now, we're gonna get to a different question. Why is the teva 
And that question been asked by Rab Moshe Yehezkel, Moshe Yehezkel Salah. He born in a city of Baghdad 125 years ago in Iraq. And he asked a question, what is the Teva? Why they call the Teva Teva? Why they didn't call it a ship or a boat or many other name like a ferry, whatever. Why did they call it Teva? Why did they give the Teva, the Ark, a name of Teva? Why is it so special? Why not any other name? So he explained, Rabbi Moshe Haskel Tzala explained like this. He said that if you look at the Teva from whichever angle you looked at it, from the top, from the side, from all different angles that you look at the Teva, it looks like a Teva, like an Ark. What it mean Teva in Hebrew mean? Argaz, Argaz is a box. That means that the Ark look like a box. A box? Why did I a box? Why did Akadosh Baruch Hu told Noah, and that will lead us now to the second, to the second idea, why is it called a box? Because Teva in Hebrew is a box. We know that when Avram Avinu gone to Egypt, we learn about it. What happened? He said to Sarai Menu, enter inside the box that the Egyptian wouldn't see you. That means that Hazal explained that the, the, the word Teva mean box. So we have to understand why did they made the Teva to look like a box? And I'm going to bring now two different opinions. So I'm going to bring the idea of the Magid Mimazrit. The Magid Mimazrit was Rabid of Ber. Rabid of Ber born in a city of Lukatsi in the Ukraine around 311 years ago. And he said, take the word Teva, divide the letters, you'll see that you'll get Bet Hashem. That the Teva being called Teva, because inside the word Teva, you get the word Bet Hashem, the house of Almighty, the house of Hashem. Why is it? Say the Magid Mimazrich, from here you learn something very important. That Akadosh Baruch Hu all the time looked after the Teva during those 12 months. 24-7, 24 for 365 days. Akadosh Baruch Hu looked after the Teva. What's hiding behind it? I was searching and I was searching and I couldn't find until Akadosh Baruch Hu opened my eyes. In the Zohar Kadosh on Parashat Vayakhel, in page 196, folio 1, page 196, folio 1, said the Zohar Kadosh, you know why the Teva have to be really covered from all corners? He said there is a mystical idea behind it. He said when a Kadosh Baruch Hu given the permission to the angel of death, to start striking and the flood came. The angel of death didn't care if he is righteous or not. He was so angry that he used all of his forces to kill. Said the Zohar, Akadosh Baruch Hu made the Teva that no human being can be seen or animal can be seen because otherwise, has the Shalom, the Teva can be struck by the angel of death. What is he done? He built it like a box. So it looked like a big log of tree or big log of wood or like a house that floating. That means that when Akadosh Baruch Hu gave him a permission to the angel of death to strike, even if there is tzaddikim, he has the shalom can be hurt. So therefore Akadosh Baruch Hu told Noah, when you build the ark, a door that is a ship, make it look like a box. And that's why it's called the Teva. That's the mystical idea behind it. Let's move on now to chapter seven, Louis chapter seven, verse four. Chapter seven, verse four. Are you with okay. me there? I'm ready. Look at it says it something very interesting. Look at the verse. כי לימים עוד שבעה, אנוכי ממתיר על הארץ ארבעים יום וארבעים לילה, ומחיתי את כל היקום. 
אשר עשיתי מעל פני האדמה. For in seven more days time I will send rain upon the earth, forty days and forty nights, and I will blot out all existing that I have made from upon the face of the, of the, of the ground. Okay, here we see that HaKadosh Baruch Hu tell Noah, listen, in seven days I'm going to bring the flood. And many of the Mepharshim ask, why did you tell Noah that you're given another seven days? Why is it so important? On a pshat of the Dvarim is to give a chance to that generation. Maybe they'll do tshuva. Maybe they're going to rectify their deeds. Maybe they'll do tshuva. They change the way. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu will forgive him. That's on a pshat of the Dvarim. Hazal in a Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, listen to that, in page 108, folio 2. Hazal said that HaKadosh Baruch Hu in those seven days changed completely, okay? Changed completely the order of the creation. What does it mean, change the order of the creation? We know that the sun rise in the east and set on the west. HaKadosh Baruch Hu changed the order that now, the sun will rise in the west and set on the east. That means that HaKadosh Baruch Hu changed the order of the creation just to tell that generation, look, something wrong here. Not only that, Hazan said that HaKadosh Baruch Hu for those seven days allowed everyone on earth to have the taste of the world to come the smell of the world to come, the enjoyment, the relaxation, the peace, and the harmony that there is in the world for the, that generation on those seven days. Hazal explain, you know why he done it? He done and he given them all of those pleasure that they will understand what they're going to lose. That means seven days, the entire world see the changing of the creation, the order of the creation, they see the thing completely different, different smell in the air, different pleasure there is in the air. If it's physical and emotional and spiritual, and they didn't change the way, then Akadosh Baruch who say now, they will understand when I'm gonna wipe the entire earth, for them to understand what they lost. And that's why HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, another seven day, he up to everything. For 120 years, he's waiting for them. And he sent Noah to try to rectify and to speak to that generation, to do tshuva, but they didn't want it. They didn't want to do atonement. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, with his mercy and compassion, given him another seven days. And those seven days, what has he done? He given them all the pleasure that there is in the world and they didn't want to change. They did. Um, because the time is going to be very short and I'm frightened again from load shedding. Uh, Louis, let's move to chapter nine. I would like to move to chapter nine because we still have to do the Aftara. And in yeah. chapter nine, verse 20, we're going to speak okay. now regarding the vineyard. Chapter 9 verse 20. Okay, Pretty, I've got it. I've got it wrong. You've got it there. Okay, good. So it said all of this. Vayahel Noah isha adama veita kerem. Noah, the man of, of the earth, he based himself and planted a vineyard. Okay. We have to understand. The Torah tells us that Noah planted a vineyard. And we have to understand why did Noah have to plant vineyard? By the way, the Zohar in our parsha in, in uh, page 73, folio 1, 73, folio 1, the Zohar tells us that on the same day that he planted the, the root of the tree of the vineyard, miracle happened. The tree grown and brought fruit and he made wine. And we know what's happened after that. You know, he got drunk. But that's not the point. We have to understand why did Noah decide to plant the tree of vineyard 
and why Dafka become suddenly decide to become a farmer. There's many other job you can do. No, you decide to become a farmer. Why a farmer? We have to ask ourselves. And why Dafka vineyard? Why Dafka grapes? The fruit of grapes. What's so special about it? The secret behind. It. So I saw a commentary of Rabbi Yosef Misning. He wrote a book that called Aronoshel Yosef, the coffin of Yosef. That's the name of the book. And he explained, you know why that Noah decided to become a farmer? Because Noah saw that in his degeneration of the flood, they committed immorality and idolatry. They used to worship idols. And none of that was enough to destroy the world. When did the world destroy? That Hazal tell us when they what it means, gezel, robbery. When they sin in robbery, Akadosh Balhu punished them and he destroyed. Say no to himself. I have all the world. It's me and my three kids and their wife and my wife and the animal. All the land in the world belong to me at the moment and my kids. I'm going to take land and I'm going to start become a farmer. Why? Because whatever I grow, I can eat and I don't have to rob. And that message he tried to tell his kids that when you work for yourself as a farmer, you can't rob anyone. What do you do? You eat from it, you sell it. You don't have to go and steal from other people. Say Rabbi Yosef Mesli, from here you learn why that Noah decide suddenly to have a new profession and to become a farmer. Okay, that's we answer why Dafka, he decided to become a farmer. But why to plant grapes? Why Dafka grapes? So we, Hazal explained, you know why Dafka grapes? Because the tree of grapes, you can never graft it with any other tree. The grapes, the tree of grapes, it's so sensitive. As soon as you try to uh, graft it with any other kind of tree, it will die. It will never take. Here Noah tried to tell his kids by that that he planted, and he tried to send message to us. The same like the grapes can never be grafted with any other kind of tree, you have to be careful not to associate with people that they're not decent. Because you see what's happened to the world when people wasn't decent. The entire world, the entire world, what's happened to the entire world completely been wiped off. Akadosh Baruch Hu destroyed the entire world. That means that Noah come and teach us here Musar, Botai. Noah come teach his son and us how much you have to be careful not to associate with people that they're not decent. Why? Because Hazal explained that inevitably, inevitably, even if you're a righteous person, but you associate with non-decent people, that would influence you in the end. That means that those unstraight people, not decent, crooks, whatever name you want to give them, it's not really the point now. That's going to affect you in the future. And not only that it will affect you, you learn from the deeds and you might going to become one of them. How Hazal explained that? Hazal call it Beta Bursukai. What it mean, Beta Bursukai? It's a place that they actually, after they shake the animal, they take the skin and they work on it. Okay? They're developing the skin. And they make from the skin whatever they make from it. They make from it a coat, they make from shoes, whatever. Hazal said, the same give us an analogy to it. A person that doesn't work on that factory, but he go inside the factory. Hazal said the smell there is so terrible that if a person just walk in and out, the smell stuck into himself, 
that you <laughs> you have to do a hundred shower, maybe it will help you. So Hazar said the same thing. When a person associate with people that they crooks, not decent people that they have all different criminal mind, although that you righteous in that specific moment, that will affect you in the future. And that's why Noah, when he get out of the Teba, the first thing that he done, he sacrificed, we said, an altar, he built the altar and he sacrificed the kosher animal. What did he sacrifice? Obviously all the kosher animal and the bird. But the second thing that he done and the Zohar said it, that he plant the vineyard. And on the same day, the grape, the grape grew, it was a miracle. And he made from a wine and then he drank. The drinking, it's a different situation. It's to teach us not to drink. The Torah tell us that story that at the beginning, a person happy when he drink. After a while, he start behaving differently. And we saw what's happened, what's led Noah to what's happened. That there's different opinion in the poskim according to the pshat of the Dvarim, that Ham saw his father naked, he gone and told his brother. Is that the Gemara there in Masechet Sanhedrin said that he actually uh, sterilized his father, okay? But that's a different issue. So what do we learn from here? That the Torah come and tell us, number one, the idea behind the grape was that it cannot mix. And a human being should be careful not to be mixed with not decent people. That's the one message. The second message is that the Torah tried to tell us that when you're drinking, you have to be careful how you're drinking. Everything in moderation. Because the drink, the alcohol, doesn't make a difference if it's wine, in daytime there was wine, but today there's many different alcohol that was in an olden day. Can lead you in the end, has shalom, when a person gets drunk, to embarrass yourself, and that can lead to a tragedy. And that's what's happened with Noah. And that's why the Torah come to teach us those few ideas. With your permission, I'm really frightened of the Lord shedding because here if they say nine, it can be before, it can be after. I would like to move to the Aftara. Louis, can we move to the Aftara? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry if I'm really short tonight, but I'm really frightened of the Lord shedding that you're gonna miss. So I'm trying to squeeze as much as I can and I'm just accelerating. So the Aftara is, the Aftara that we're gonna read this coming Shabbos, it's from the prophet Yeshayahu. In chapter 54, in chapter 54, verse one. And the Torah tell us like, the, the, the prophet tell us like this. Okay, Runi akara lo yalada, pitzhiri na uchali, לא חלה כי רבים בני שוממה מבני בעולה אמר אדוני. no, before Lech Lecha. Before Lech Lecha. I know, I know it's before Lech Lecha. And you say it's um, uh, 54. It's, uh, it's Astarat Yeshayahu in chapter 54, 1, and chapter 5 until chapter 5. Turuni Akara. Turuni Akara. Let me just check here what page you can find. Sorry. No, double one three one. No, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's okay. Okay, I'm ready. Which okay, I'll read it. Read this one. First one. Sing out, O better one. 
who has not given birth break out to, into glad song and be jubilant. O oh, one who has not labored pains for the, for the children of the desolated Jerusalem, outnumber the children of inhabitable city, said Hashem. Here we see something very interesting that the prophet tell us that a barren woman should be happy, listen to that, that she doesn't have kids. How can a barren woman can be happy that she doesn't have kids? Not only that, he said to her, Pitairina, start singing, Vetsahali, be happy, be in joy. Why? Because you don't have kids. How can you say that to a barren woman? So Hazal the Mefarshim explained that what the prophet actually speak here, he's speaking to the land of Eretz Israel. And he said that what it say Akara, barren, he's speaking to the land of Eretz Israel. That the land of Eretz Israel must be very happy. Many of the people say, what are you talking about? The Mefarshim explained that the prophet say, that the land of Eretz Israel should be happy that she's like a barren. What it means like a barren? That there is no natural resources in Eretz Israel. Like we know in Africa, for example, South Africa, we have a lot of natural resources. We have gold, we have silver, we have copper, we have diamond and etc. many other natural resources. These other country that have oil and natural resources. He say, if you look at Israel, it's like a barren country said the prophet. There is no natural resources in Eretz Israel. He said, and for that, Eretz Israel, the land of Eretz Israel, you should be happy. The Mephalshim asked, why? Why are you saying it? How can you say such thing? He said that at the moment, the land of Israel doesn't have natural resources that we can see in our eyes. And you know why is it? Because as is the land of Eretz Israel, everyone wanted. We see what our cousin doing to us, the fighting that our cousin doing to us. In the time of the crusade, we know that they all came. They fought for the land of Eretz Israel. They wanted to conquer Eretz Israel and they managed. In every generation was a fight about the land of Eretz Israel. Said a prophet, Akadosh Baruch Hu made a special favorite and kindness and compassion to that land that it's an outside, it looks like she doesn't have any natural resources. You know why? Because if it will be natural resources that people can see that there's a lot of diamond in the land of Eretz Israel, a lot of oil in the land of Eretz Israel, gold, and all the other, other nature, nature resources that there is in the world, the, the nation will come and start fighting and will kick out the Jewish people from the country. That's mean that they're gonna wipe up the Jewish nation. For what? Just to conquer the land of Eretz Israel because there is so many natural resources. He said, because as is, you see the problem that the land have, that people wanted. Imagine if it was natural resources, what would happen? He said, so the land of Eretz Israel, you should be happy that you don't have natural resources that people can see. When the Mashiach comes, then he'll change everything, as the prophet said, that will be beautiful stone, precious stone on every corner, on every street, and they're not going to have a value. But he said, now, until the Mashiach come, you should be happy that your natural resources is not exposed, that people can't see it. And that's why we should be happy. That's about the Aftara and Be'ezrat Hashem, that we should all merit to see Be'ezrat Hashem speedily in our days, that the coming of the Mashiach, the building of Bet HaMikdash. And then we see all the natural resources that will be in Eretz Israel, that will be in Eretz Israel, eyes in eyes, that mean eye in behind, that mean eye to eyes, everyone will see it. But by then, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gonna be in control in the Mashiach, and then they can't do nothing. But at the moment that the Mashiach didn't come yet, Be'ezrat Hashem, she'll come in our days, speedily in our days. 
Okay, the land have to keep her natural resources hidden from everyone. If there is any question, you can unmute and you can ask, and I definitely will try to answer if I can. Bezat Hashem, Blineder. Hello, Anthony. How are you? Baruch Hashem, Antonio. How are you? Right. How many yes. people drown? How many people drowned in the flood altogether? How many people drowned in the flood altogether? Sure. <laughs> I really don't know. I have no clue. I can't tell you. <laughs> I don't know. The entire new, the entire Earth. That means if you take all of Earth, all of Earth completely wiped off. How many people? I have no idea. Sorry, I can't answer you that. That's a definitely can't answer. <laughs> I don't think that many people can tell you. Because in that Thanks time, very much. People, not many people knew. They didn't have, not every country make, how many people was there, how many people wasn't. Okay, thanks very much. Pleasure, yeah, any well, other question? Yes, I, I, I'd like to ask a question, um, if speaking? it's possible. Who's speaking? Thank Jeffrey Allen. Oh, Jeffrey. How's it, Jeffrey? Oh. <laughs> Hi, Rabbi. How are you? I, I'd just like to ask a question on this. Hashem showed the world with seven days in ahead what it was going to be like in the world to come. You would think that they would grab it. It would be like that. But it's exactly like the same in the world today, isn't it? We want the Absolutely. here and now. We want self-gratification. We're not interested in what's going to happen in the future. So isn't this a a warning for us. Isn't this a, a telling us who we are and what we are and, and the world has become? And that's why we're having all this problem with the rest of the world. And we're, we're separate from them because we do see something ahead of us. We do work towards it. We still try to get our minds around it. That's what we do. But the world is, and if we mix with them, as you quite rightly said with the, with the wine, if we mix with them, we do get tainted and we become like them. And we all end up doing something like them. So uh, you would think, would you not, that uh, the world to come is something very, very special and you can understand why they didn't accept it. Isn't that so? What so do you I'll think? Explain, I'll explain like this. First of all, what you say is 100%. The Zohar Kadosh say that before the Mashiach come, listen to that, before the Mashiach come, the Zohar promise that all the generation that was from the day of the creation until today, they're all going to be reincarnated in the last generation. Wow. You know, if you look, people that I'm speaking about homosexuality. Homosexuality in our religion is forbidden. And the punishment, we know the punishment is there. Today, if you look just 20 years back, it was embarrassment to mention that word. Today, people march those pride march and they're proud about it. That's exactly what it was in a generation of the flood. People robbing immorality that there is in the world. It's beyond understanding exactly that generation. Hazal explained to us that we'll see things unnatural. I remember when I came to South Africa 30 years ago, in summer, during the day was hot. Four o'clock came, thundering, okay. lightning. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, I'm talking about 33 years ago, 30 years ago. Four o'clock come, you hear the thundering, the lightning, it's rain, pouring, and the sun coming again. Today, it's completely opposite. Look at the weather today. It's rain, it's cold in summer, in cold. Unnormal. Akadosh Baruch Hu hinting to us, look what's happened to the generation of the flood. Try to learn from it. See, I'm changing nature. I'm changing the order of the nature. It can't be that sometime in summer, you have to wear a hot jacket. I never remember 30 years ago. Yes, it was hot, boiling. It came down, it's cooled down, but it was hot. I didn't have to wear a jacket. 
that the temperature will drop, that I need to wear a jacket in summer. It's unheard of. It's again another sign. So the Zohar tell us, before the Mashiach come, I'm going to do again the same thing that I've done to that generation. And we'll see who's going to survive it. Those that will be like Noah, that will stick to Akadosh Baruch Hu, stick to the Almighty, stick to the Holy Torah, they will survive. Those that not, we don't know. I don't want to say. You yeah, follow? Yeah, you follow? Yeah, you follow? Yeah, Okay, so you're, you're, you're saying that the biggest signs are right there now in front of our eyes with the climate change around the whole world. It's all For sure. Look at the corruption in the world. Look at the corruption in the world. It's beyond understanding. I'm not talking only about South Africa, Jeffrey. I'm not talking here. I'm talking all over. The corruption that there is in every country in the world is beyond understanding. Beyond understanding. That's what I'm saying. So the sign is on the wall. We just have to know how to read them and how to put them together to understand, yes. to understand the message. You follow? Okay, yes, great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Eitan, I see that you wanted to ask a question. Bechavod, Eitan. Yes, sorry, Rebbe. Sorry that I was late. I, there was a Zoom meeting for the, the new counselor that, the, you know, there was a whole Zoom meeting. Yeah, for the past yeah hours. no problem. Talking that, so I just I had to come on to your show because it gives me chizuk for the for the week. So I appreciate that, and I'm really happy to join. Um, Thank, you. So actually, Thank you. It's my it's my parsha. So uh, mm -hmm. you know. So you want to tell us a chiddush? You tell us a chiddush. Well, I haven't prepared a lot, but I was actually mummy saying to someone the other day, and, and Rob just touched on the point now that I said. How is it that we're actually in the same situation we were we were during the, the, the flood? In other words, the corruption, the immorality, everything. Everything is basically the same as was before. You know, and, I, and I forgot for a moment, I said, so why doesn't Hashem bring the flood now? But he reminded me that uh, Hashem, you know, basically said in a promise that it will never, it'll never happen again. But I think the question is now that we obviously we, uh, Hashem had to, like, you know, cleanse the world from, from all those... Um, you know, all those corruption and everything. So that's what I was trying to understand. I think you, you may have just answered with a Zohar saying like, what is it now that Hashem will help us to kind of come back to do tshuva? Because there's so much corruption and everything like before, but what is happening now to, to tell us that, listen, if you don't behave yourself, it's going to be, we can't say another flood because uh, he promised not another flood, but really those signs, and I think you just ex explained it, which I appreciate, but it's, it's nice to see and hear that, um, we need to look out for those signs because we, we need to do tshuva because we don't know what's, you know, Hashem's plan is. He hasn't explained to us what's going to happen next. It could be worse than the flood. It could be any other thing. So thank you for explaining that. I'll tell you what else the Zohar say. I'm not going to tell you everything because then you're not going to sleep at night because you're going to be afraid. But the Zohar explained that when the Mashiach come and Hazal, many of the commentary, not only the Zohar, the Mashiach come, it's going to be in a stage. It's going to be a stage that, number one, that the Mashiach is going to be the king of the nation. The Mashiach is not going to be in charge about us. The Mashiach is going to make peace and harmony amongst all the nations in the world. He's going to be their king. But they're going to vote him as a king. Why? Because they say we have enough from all the corruption, we have enough from all the immorality that's happened in the world, that all of those leaders that brought us so down. So the Mefarshim asks, so who's gonna look after the Jewish nation? Listen to that, Eitan, listen to that carefully. HaKadosh Baruch Hu Bechvodo Ba'atzmo, the Almighty himself gonna be in charge about the Jewish people. That's mean, that the Jewish people are going to be in a different situation, in a different class to all the rest of the nation. HaKadosh Baruch Hu will isolate us in a different level. Why? For all of those that stuck to his religion, kept the Torah, kept the mitzvot, they're going to be getting all the rewards 
that we mentioned in the Sheol, that seven days before the flood came, okay, HaKadosh Baruch Hu actually given him all the pleasure that will be in the world to come. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu then, every Jew that have a belief in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, absorbed the mitzvot, kept the Torah, will benefit from it. And who's going to be in charge about it? HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Bechvodo Ba'atzmu. The Almighty Himself, He's going to be the King of the Jewish people. Well, the Mashiach is going to look after who? The rest of the nations in the world. Do you understand that? So there is a good thing to look. There is a, there is a hope. It's right a shame that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will have mercy and compassion on all the people in the world. That He doesn't punish us, has Shalom or punish the world, has Shalom, not us, us definitely not, because we, Baruch Hashem is nation. He wouldn't punish the world the same like he done in a time that we saw what happened in the flood, many people get killed, Inquisition, the Holocaust, Hamanitsky and his son with all the program. We don't want to see that anymore. We want to see only good the Jewish people praying to HaKadosh Baruch Hu all the time. And that's what we've done in Haggah Sukkot, Shiv'im Parim. What it means, Shiv'im Parim? 70 sacrifices they brought on Haggah Sukkot. Why? To do a torment to the nation, that the nation will benefit from it. And only on Shmini Atzeret we brought one par. What it mean one bar? One par, one sacrifice. Why? That here it was the intimate holiday between us and Akadosh Baruch Hu. Again, to answer all of that, I'm linking what it says on Sukkot, what we explain on, on Haga Sukkot and Shmini Atzeret, into what's happening in the parsha. You follow? Rabbi Levi. <coughs> yes. Uh, if the Mashiach is going to be the king of all the other nations, that means he's the king of all the Goyim. So my question to you is, is the Mashiach not Jewish then? I never said that. I said the Mashiach have to be Jewish. No, that's, that's a question. The Mashiach, when he comes, I understand your question, but I have to be very specific. The Mashiach definitely is a Jewish person. The Mashiach, when he comes, he's going to start doing the law and order in the world. But after there is law and order in the world, they're gonna, the, the going going to choose him to be their leader, that he's going to be their king. They chose him. That's going to be a Jewish king in charge about them. The same like the time of when we have the king, David HaMelech, Shlomo HaMelech, when Shlomo HaMelech was a king, all the world used to come to him, to his Chochmah, to consult with him to understand how he's, how he running the land of Eretz Israel, how is Bet Amigdash. So that means that the Mashiach will be definitely a Jewish person. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu then will give him that job that he will look after the nation and the Almighty gonna look after us. That's what I'm saying. There's a big difference, you follow? But the Mashiach will come. The, the Mashiach will be will come come in on a donkey to Yerushalayim. Nachon, nachon. And Not only then... that, he's gonna do the resurrection of the dead. He's gonna do the ash of the red heifer. You know the water. He's gonna sprinkle because then we're gonna become pure. We explain that, and then we can understand the Torah and will never be mahloket anymore. And he will live in, in, in Israel. For sure, where are you going to live? In South Africa? <laughs> no, so I'll tell you another <laughs> thing that the Zohar say. I'll tell you another thing. The Zohar say, Atida Yerushalayim li pashet al kol Eret Israel. Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, going to be the size of all, the size of Eret Israel, not the size of Eret Israel of today, the size of Eret Israel that was when the Jewish people conquered in the time of Yoshua Binun. Okay? That means part of Damascus, part of when you go towards the Jordanian Valley, going to be much bigger state. That's Jerusalem, just the city of Jerusalem. 
And then Hazal continues and say, And the land of Eretz Israel that the land of Eretz Israel, listen, will be all over the world. So we don't understand. It's definitely Eretz Israel. And everyone will listen to the Mashiach. And everyone wants the Mashiach. It's just that the Mashiach will be so busy with the nation that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will look after the Jewish people. Those that obviously absorb the mitzvot, the learn Torah, and etc. You follow? And those who are not Shomer mitzvot? Be'ezrat Hashem, they'll do tshuva. Be'ezrat Hashem, they'll do tshuva. Okay, Shka, thank you. Okay, I'm frightened that it's going to be a load shedding. It can cut any minute. If there is any question, no problem, ask. But if there is load shedding, please understand that it's not me. Any other question regarding the Sheol, the Parsha? Well, can no. I just ask you the, 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 the Mashiach story? I think it's a very um, not talked about subject. We, you know, we, in the sense of we know Mashiach is coming for Zat Hashem, but it's, it's just not very clear unless you can expand on the idea of the Mashiach, like you said, he will be the king of the other nations, Hashem will be the you know, king of us, but you, you know, see, obviously what have and would have the... Zal in the Gemara tell us that it's not good I'll tell you how Hazal said the Gemara said what it means Yipah Ruham that they saw going to come out those that are trying to work it out when the Mashiach come. Why? Because the Gemara continues to say, Please, please, I beg you, do not try to work it out when the Mashiach come. Every time the Mashiach was supposed to come and people start telling the date, a matter of fact, it was a tragedy happened. So that's what many people are afraid to speak about the Mashiach. Why? Because we don't want to delay the coming of the Mashiach. We can speak about Mashiach. We obligate to believe that the Mashiach will come. It's one of the 13 principles. But not to speak about dates when it's going to come, when is it going to happen. That's beyond us. You follow? But yeah, fuller. I think that I think I appreciate that extra information because I, I think I was more asking about what's going to happen afterwards. I think it's just not very ah, clear. What's going like, to happen you, after Mashiach come? Yeah, I'm just saying, like in the sense we know that Chia Samais, yeah. we know he'll be king of the nations, Hashem will keep the king of us. But I'm saying, in terms of our purpose in this world, like now we are diving for Mashiach, we're doing tshuva. You know, the purpose in this world is very different when Mashiach comes. Mashiach comes, sure. we it's almost like we won't have that that. Uh, uh, it's like a Bechir will be taken away from us because we'll see straight away that Hashem exists. So what will our purpose no, really be then? That's what I'm trying to say. How will the world look like? What will be the... So, mm. the... so the Rambam, the great eagle, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, that born in a city of Cordova in Spain, 891 years ago. 881 years ago. Sorry, 881 years ago. He said like this, a person will not going to know what's going to happen until it was happened. But olam no noheg, the world will continue, the Rambam said, but we cannot understand what's going to happen until the Mashiach comes. Why? Because we're limited. Let me explain to you one idea. When the Mashiach comes, he's going to sprinkle the, the red heifer water, and that's going to cleanse us from all the tumah, all the tumah that there is in the world, the, all the impurity that there is in the world. And then we will understand the Torah, to listen to that, so clearly that we're not going to have any problem to understand anything from the Torah. You read the Gemara and you'll understand it perfectly. Not only that, we're not going to be mahlokot in Israel. Why? Because everyone understand now. Understand the halacha. So the joy and the pleasure will be that when you learn the Torah, you learn the Torah on a different level. And the level that you don't have to break your head. And the level that you can enjoy what all the mystical rabbi learn, you will understand 
without any doubt, without any question. It's gonna be like you looking at the sun, you know that outside now it's dark, it's night, the same like it's clear to you that now it's night in South Africa, all the pleasure that in the Torah that there is, that Hazard's speaking about, that's what you'll have. That means that the gold, the money, all the things that people are running to their after, immorality, or whatever you want to name it, people are not going to enjoy it. Why? Because it will be on a street. Everyone can just go and pick it up. Everyone will have to enjoy, I'm talking about Jewish people, the Holy Torah. And that's where we're going to be. We're going to be in a different level, in a different standard of life that we will appreciate not the physical, the spiritual part of life, that we don't understand what it's going to be. That's how the Rambam explained. I mean, obviously, I add up some of my word to you to give you the analogy to understand where we're going to be. You follow, Eitan? Thank you, Rabbi. Yes, I appreciate that. Really? I just, I was just also concerned, like just trying to understand in terms of the, of the, of doing tshuva, and in the sense of like uh, now we, we, we have bechira, right? We have the choice to do right and wrong, because we don't see Hashem properly. We, but now I'm saying then it'll be so clear that Hashem exists. So therefore, the, the purpose of life is going to change. It's going to only be already an ah, like enjoying from the Torah. It won't be like should I do right and wrong? You won't have that mm -hmm. choice anymore. So it's almost no. like a lama bow. It'd be like melachim. I mean, that's what I'm trying to understand. Um, that the, sure, the whole, for sure. Yeah. Look, will be people, will be people, but not going to be any war. No more war. All of that's going to change. That they're going to take all the vessel that they use for war, all the weapon, and they're going to use it because not going to be any more the yetzerara, not going to be the evil inclination. And you say it every morning. And that time when the Mashiach comes, all the world will know that there is only one Mashiach. All the world will know that there is one God. And the God is going to be in charge about all of us. So there is no more Yetzirah. There's no more idol worshipping. There's no more evil inclination. And if there's no more evil inclination, there's all nothing, nothing to worry. The world going to go to cleansing in a different level that we don't understand. Once that all the world will know that there's only one God and there is no more Yetzirah, you're not going to do any more other world. Hazal tell us, Vigar Zevim Keves, that a wolf will live together with a sheep, and that the time of the Mashiach. It's a different world. That even the predator's animal that was in a time before, before the flood, used to eat only straw. That's what's going to happen. So, so, Rav, so, so well, what, is, what is the key it's thing right scary. now? What is the key thing right now that we can do to bring that? Because obviously that, you know, it sounds incredible and amazing. You don't want sickness. You had the times of Noah where he tried to make care of the world. Hashem brought the flood. I mean, the Mashiach should have come then. The time of Abraham, uh, when he, when he uh, recognized Hashem, like Mashiach should have come then. Um, there's so many times. Hashem, what is it now that we can do? That Rav can say right now that every day we should be doing to bring Mashiach now because the, st the story you've said now is beautifully played, painted. And I think if we truly believe that, we can take away all the suffering, all the, the money problems, all the. We should be yearning like this, this like this, like every a, a person starving um, for, for food. Why aren't we yearning for this so, so desperately? Is it because we don't believe enough or we, or we just. Where, what is it that we can do every moment to, to bring this, this uh, Yeshua? Hazal explained to him, Hazal explained to us like this. You want to survive Hebloshel Mashiach, the pain birth of Mashiach. You want to survive those difficult times? I'm giving you two 
two reason. That means I'm giving you two suggestions and you have to stick to it. learn Torah, hasadim. What it means, gmilut hasadim, main kindness. When a person will do learn Torah and main kindness, there's no higher level than that. And Hazal guarantee that if you learn Torah and main kindness, I'm guarantee you that you survive those pain bursts of the Mashiach. Nothing gonna happen. So who doesn't want it? Here's the answer, Hazal tell us in the Gemara. Ya'asok batorah u'bigmilut hasadim. Everyone must learn Torah, obviously, to the level that he can, the level that he understand. You understand? You can't suddenly start tomorrow and say, listen, I'm going to start now, start reading the Zohar, and I can understand the Zohar. Or I can take Sefer Tri Eit Haim of uh, Ariya Kadosh, and I can, you wouldn't find, you, you, you wouldn't find your head there. You wouldn't find even your, your, your shoes there. Never mind, Lehavdi, Lehavdi. You wouldn't know where you are. You have to go stage by stage. You can start Mikra, Mishnah, Gmara. There is plenty halachot that we have to learn. Musar, that's why I brought the Musar at the beginning of the show, how important is it? That the Gaon Vilna cried when he hear what the Magid Miduvna have to tell him, Rabbi Yaakov Mikrens. All of this, all of this we need. That's the most important, the basic. We start with the basic. Dug milut hasadim. Help people. Wherever you can to help people, there is no higher protection than that. You want a guardians? This is your guardians. You follow, Eitan? You learn Torah? The Zohar say, magna umatzla. What does it mean, magna umatzla? That's in Aramic. Hazal say, magna umatzla, megina. It protects you. Umatla, she actually gonna be save you. That means if you learn Torah, it's gonna protect you from all bad things, and it's gonna save you from all other bad things that come into the world. So you want a protection, and you are the guardian. Torah, only Torah, and that's what we're trying to do. That's what I've done on, on in Oshana Rabbah. We've done this marathon of four hours. And Be'ezrat Hashem, I'm planning to do again marathon with more rabbis. The, the rabbi was so excited to do again. We'll do one day that there's a public holiday or there's any holiday that we have a break that people don't have to wake up in the morning to run to work, to jump on a wagon, to do again another few shorim for a few hours. You know, the commentary that I got, that people were so happy, that they enjoy, it's, it's beyond understanding. And that's what we have to do. So if a person can teach Torah, we can teach Torah. A person can do Gmilut Hasadim. And Gmilut Hasadim is a wide range of Gmilut Hasadim. If you can help a people to solve problem that there is, that you know that halachically they correct, what there is bigger thing than that? Gmilut hasadim, it's peace between a husband and a wife, between two people that have a fight, that have parable, and you bring peace between them. That's gmilut hasadim. I'm giving you a simple. A person needs to change a tire because he has a puncture and he doesn't know, and you help him. That's gmilut hasadim. To say to a person, I go one step forward, to say to a person, good morning, how are you? to give him a good feeling, to yeah. boost him, to look after him, that's Gmilut Hasadim. You done Gmilut Hasid. That's what we need now. Hazal tell us, what a person can do. Hazal given us the answer and the question. What are you gonna do in this world to survive those difficult times? Learn Torah and do men kindness. That's all. <laughs> what more difficult? Hazal didn't tell you, take a person, pay him a million rand. No, you can pay him one rand. 
It's already gemilut chesed. Look after people. People need help. People need the good words. That's gemilut chesed. You follow Eitan? I hope I answer your question correctly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Eitan, by the way, you look Baruch Hashem well. I love to see your smile. Baruch Hashem, you're looking well. Eitan Ben Adasa, we're davening for you. Baruch Hashem. Please, God, refuah shlema speedily. Amen. Right. Thank you, Rav. I'm, I'm a bit of an angle yeah, because I'm lying on the bed, but thank it's you for fine. that. It's really Don't worry about me. It. And, and when you send me a, a, a little, a, like you say, you send me a little tumuna in the morning, you say good morning. You know, it, it brings a smile to me. It's a little, it's a little thing. Today, with the technology, it's so easy to do Kimur Chasadim. We can send a, a smile, a picture, um, a, you know, a bracha, whatever. So it means a lot. And I really appreciate you always asking me how I'm doing. So I really feel, uh, I really feel special. So thank you. I thank you for your Kimur Chasadim and, and giving me chizuk to get through this difficult time. What, there's right Hashem. We should all merit to do together so that or daya speedily and quickly with no pain for you. Amen, amen, amen. Good. Guys, uh, any other question maybe you have? If not, we already almost one and a half hours. Please God that the people at ESCOM forget forget themselves and we're not going to have a load shedding. It was an ESCOM, it was a city power. It's the city power, Oscar, sorry. Sorry, Mr. Le Mr. Electrician, uh, Louis. Um, <laughs> excuse my ignorance. <laughs> no problem, Rabbi. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to take the Weird opportunity to wish things. all of you Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. And the, Shalom. Large, the mitzvah that we'll do will bring the Mashiach. Look at the beautiful rain. Oh, my. Oh, oh, Dr. Les said that it's raining. Dr. Leeds, we say Meshiva Ruach Morida Geshe. Not not few days after that, South Africa have a beautiful rain. Yeah, and that's what the that most important that Eretz Takodesh will have. I thought it was a thundering and the lightning. I just missed it because I wanted to say the book and you will all say Amen. But yeah. it's gone too quickly. So I didn't have yeah. a chance. Shekohog Vuratom Aleolam. But Be'ezrat Hashem, I would like to wish you a good night to all of you. Okay. Be'ezrat be Hashem, to enjoy Shabbos and to see Mashiach Tzitkenu speedily in our days. Shabbat Shalom. And we'll meet everybody on Sunday night. And we'll meet everybody yes, on Sunday night. Shalom. Shikayach Ralph. Shabbat Shalom. Can I ask you just one question on the, on the, on the yeah. lightning and the, the thunder? As, as far as I learned, I could be wrong, is that you have to see the lightning in order to say the broken for the thunder because sometimes you hear thunder and it might just be like a boom or something so you can't say if you just hear thunder you have to see the lightning and then say the bracha and then if there's thunder then say the thunder is that is that right or am I, am I got it wrong you have to see it because there is two brachot two different brachot okay if you hear it and usually when you hear it you see the light coming outside even if you're in your room you don't see the sky, but you can see mm. the entire thing lightning. So if you hear it, Baruch Atah Hashem Shekohog Vuratom Ale Olam. But you have to see, you have to see the lightning to say, I say my separate shoots. You have to see the lightning. Without... Can, nahon, yes. When you see it, the lightning, when there is no thundering, when you don't hear the noise, there is a different situation. I'm talking about when you hear the noise. But you hear it and you don't see the, the lightning, you don't say the brocha. Correct? Why? You say if you if you hear it, if you hear it, <laughs> and you can see the light, you don't see it directly, you see it through the window, you can see that yeah, if, you, the if, light, you, if you hear it. But, but, yeah, if you hear it, but you don't see the lightning. I heard I heard you don't say the brocha because you don't know what sound it's, it could be a boom in the in the background or something. You have to hear it with, with still seeing the lightning, whether it's a flash or a Whatever it is, you still so have that's to. That's what I'm saying. That mm. when you say to hold Vuratam Maleolam, it's the noise and the light that you see through your window. You don't have to look to the sky. That's what I'm saying. Mm. You follow. And then, uh, then I say my very I say my separate sheets only said when only you when see you the see, lightning. Only when you see the light, you don't hear the thundering. You follow. And if you see both, if you hear and see both at the same time. Um, then you have to say, 
and that covers for both. That's the string, yeah. That's the string. Okay. You follow? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, good night. All the best, Shabbat everyone. Shalom, bro. Enjoy you. the rest thank of the night. Thank you. Much, thank you. Thank you. We'll see you all on Sunday night. Oh, yeah, Shabbat, shalom. <laughs> Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shabbat shalom, bro. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.